Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're just gonna kind of let people get situated for a brief moment, but my name is Caroline Roulard. I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement. And I'm here with Andy Huzio. We're super excited to have you all joining us. Um, before I hand it over to Andy, I just wanted to say a few kind of housekeeping things. Um, one of the best ways to, to view this, um, if you would like to see Andy speaking in addition to the slides, is up at the top of your screen, you should hopefully see a little box that says view options, and you can select side by side mode that will allow you to view the speaker and the slides simultaneously. We also would love for you to submit any questions you might have along the way. So you're welcome to do that in the chat. And if you're having any issues at all technically, um, I think a lot of us are, are pretty adept at Zoom at this point, um, but you're welcome to chat me as well and I can help with that. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy. Great. Um, welcome everyone. I am just really delighted to be here and to to see you. Um, my, uh, my name is Andy Huzio. I um, started here at Phillips Academy in 2007. Uh, I teach philosophy and religious studies. So I've, I've been in the chapel basement. Since then, I teach classes on Asian religions and the Holocaust, views of human nature, um, a range of different topics. I've been a house counselor primarily in dorms down on Abbott, so Stearns and uh, French House and Draper Cottage, things like that. I've coached soccer and ultimate Frisbee and basketball. So I feel very fortunate to be a member of this uh, residential community. And um, I've been involved with the Tang Institute uh, for a number of years. The Institute itself began in 2014 and I started uh, working with Tang originally as a fellow. Um, I started out with um, the Institute doing some work connected to mindfulness, uh, which was something that interested me trying to think about how to help that in classrooms and uh, how to help teachers and staff uh, just be a little bit more mindful. And then in 2018, I, I took over as the director. What I wanted to do uh, though, just before we got started, I thought it would be nice um, just to, uh, if people were willing just to, in the chat, if you wanted to put your name and your class and maybe where you're zooming in from, I think it can be nice just to get a sense of who's on the call and where we're from. Um, if anyone's from the class of 11 or 16, I, a special hello to you as our paths no doubt have crossed. Um, on campus. Okay, great. Massachusetts, California, Geneva. Arzu Singh, hello Arzu, class of 16. Originally from Montreal, now Connecticut. Oh, Nat, hey Nat. Um, London and what, yeah, so this is, this is great. From Chicago, four stories above John Palfrey. Wonderful, I, oh, Zarisu Jones, nice to see you. Yeah, so this is great, yeah. Maybe you can just dangle a string down below and tell John that we're, uh, you know, a message on a string out the window or something, yeah. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, I, I'm, I'm super happy to see some familiar names and some familiar faces. Um, and my hope today is to just spend a little bit of time talking about the workshop, which is this particular program we're doing here um, at the Institute, and then to uh, finish and leave some time for questions or for comments or, or, or things like that. So with that, let's get started. I, I, I want to begin uh, just by saying a little bit about the Institute and what it is. This is our new home. It's in the library. Um, I'm here right now. Uh, we've we were really fortunate, you know, back on campus, we had 90% of the students back on campus in the springs. So we were able to use this space um, for students in the workshop and, and for other students more broadly. When I think about our work here, our work here is really guided by three fundamental questions. 
Uh, the first question is this, how do we inspire deep student learning? So the most important thing we do here at the Institute is to try to think about student learning. Uh, that often refers to interdisciplinary work. We're working with teachers in a range of academic departments to help them refine and reimagine their courses. So just to give two examples of this, um, one, we've been working with our economics students um, and we've been partnering with uh, Raj Chetty, who's an economist at Harvard, who some of you may know uh, in the Opportunity Insights Project. So this has our students looking at big data connected to uh, both the COVID recovery, which he worked on more recently, I think at trackthecovery.org and questions about the Opportunity Atlas, which is this extraordinary map he's put together that um, offers really a block by block uh, map with that looks at questions of socioeconomic mobility in America. So how does your uh, upward mobility depend upon your zip code in some ways is, is a shorthand way of thinking about that. So this is a way of getting our students in contact with graduate students and with cutting edge academic research uh, in, in that particular course. Another wonderful example that uh, I'm really proud of that we've been doing here through Tang for the last couple of years is with our uh, computer science courses. We've got this great partnership between um, our computer science teachers and a philosophy teacher here. Uh, and the goal is to embed more ethical reflection into our, our computer science courses. And, you know, in, in the language of uh, Andover, what we would say actually, it really is just that knowledge of how to code is not enough, right? There has to be this goodness as well. It has to be joined with, uh, moral reflection and questions about privacy, questions about accessibility, um, questions around addiction and things like that. What does it mean to design an addictive app if that's a profit maximizing thing? Are there other goods or other goals we might have? So that's something that students have really resonated with. And similar to the econ project, we've been able to collaborate with professors at Harvard and professors at Northeastern and uh, other uh, academic institutions. The next question, which is related to this in some ways, of course, is how do we support ongoing faculty research? Um, our students are, of course, our primary focus, but they're only here for one or two or three or four years. If we can get our faculty in touch with cutting edge research, if we can help our faculty pursue uh, passions that they're interested in, it um, will keep them here, right? So the, the Institute is very important in terms of retaining faculty, uh, but it, it also has a magnetizing force. It recruits them and it helps uh, keep them learning and growing, which I think is really what we get into um, education for. So those two project I met, projects I mentioned before are great examples of faculty collaborating with each other, you know, with the economics project. We also have statistics teachers working there. So they're working with teachers in other disciplines. They're visiting each other's classes. They're doing that kind of work. Um, and then the third question, which follows from these in some ways is, how do we engage in meaningful outreach and partnership? This was very central to Oscar Tang's aspiration and, and, and goal in the founding of the Institute. Um, it was Ted Sizer who used the language of Andover being a private school with a public purpose. Uh, but what does it mean to think about this work that we're doing, not just benefiting those, you know, 100 students a year who take economics or 200 students who take computer science, like that's great. And that's really wonderful in terms of impact here at Phillips Academy, but there are many more students uh, in the country and around the world than just the students we have here. So Oscar's uh, aspiration, I think, was really to have our work in dialogue with um, the work of educators being done at other schools, being in dialogue with higher ed and think tanks and educational nonprofits and finding ways to both bring their good work and research in, like we're seeing with the Opportunity Insights example, but also in turn to share our work out. So what we'll be doing um, starting next year with the economics work, for example, is training teachers Right, so our teachers will train and mentor other teachers. Uh, we did that last summer with the Ethics and Computer Science Project and we'll do that again this year. Uh, so anyways, that gives you a bit of a sense of some of the 
some of our deep aspirations uh, that we uh, are doing here at Tank, some sample work and our guiding questions. What I want to talk to you more about today, though, is this, a, a project that we've undertaken called the workshop. Um, and this question is one that we came across as we were doing some research about reimagining schooling. I think it's really a wonderful one. I know all of you can read, uh, and I don't always love reading stuff on text, but I, I just, I, I even just like articulating this question out loud because it, 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 it continues to evoke a sense of wonder in me, right? It's this, if we didn't have the schools we have today, would we create the schools we have today? So I've been able to ask this to parents, I've been able to ask this to alums, to trustees, to fellow teachers, and it's interesting. Some people will say yes, of course, some people say no, of course not, and you hear what people would value and what people wouldn't. So for us, what we wanted to do with the workshop was this. Uh, we wanted to say, if you could start from scratch, right? If your project was one of reimagination and reinvention and not just sort of tinkering around the edges, adding five minutes to a class or, you know, extending the school day by 30 minutes. But if you really had a blank canvas, what would you do and why would you do it? So that, that was our inspiration. That's what we were trying to take on uh, in this project. And that fits into school change. You know, I was alluding to this a little bit before in some important ways. Schools are often uh, somewhat conservative institutions, right? The schedule of Andover likely looks pretty, the daily and weekly schedule likely looks pretty similar to what it was when all of you were students there. Um, and it's set up in that way to be efficient, to prioritize efficiency, right? We have 1,150 students here. We have a certain number of classes. We have a grid that we sort of put them in. You have math in the morning um, and maybe language after that, you know, when someone else has language first and then math later in the day. And that's fine, right? We are designing an institution like this to efficiently educate 1,150 students. But there are other questions we can ask. What we have done the last two years as we've undertaken this project in reimagining school is to interview students, to interview seniors and ask them a, a pretty straightforward question. It's, it's this, it's what's the best work you've done at Andover? So we ask them this question, we listen to them, right? And they say, well, it's when I had time to, to really do research. A number of them talk about their History 300 or their History 30 papers, right? That was the moment when I became a historian in a sense. I wasn't just sort of doing history class with timelines and multiple choice questions or answering teachers questions. I had to work to find a research question. You know, I, I went into the archives or I was doing some research. There was a false start, but then I found something. Students will talk about uh, submitting an essay and just revising it and revising it, you know, knowing that not even really being concerned about the grade, but just wanting to get it right. Um, other students, you know, talk about the opportunity to connect what they're doing uh, to deep concerns of their own. So, you know, that Opportunity Insights project is so wonderful because students from all over the country, you know, we had a student from West Virginia do something about his hometown in West Virginia. We have, um, you know, students in Andover, uh, in the greater Andover area. So Andover, Lawrence, Lowell, Methuen often looking at the differences in opportunity and just five, 10, 15 miles apart from each other. So these themes begin to emerge around independent research, around um, doing the work that, that experts do in a sense, right? And getting mentoring, mentoring and coaching and scaffolding for that. Around having some choice, right? Not just doing what your teachers tell you to do and having this deep connection to the material, right? Being both uh, intellectually and emotionally invested in it. So for us, those answers translated into design principles of the workshop, okay? We said, how can we take what we've heard from the students and, you know, 
move out of sort of educational theory land of reimagining school and this and that, but actually say like, what are we going to do like day by day and week by week and project by project. So just in a basic level, what we said to the students is, here's the thing. You can do this, it's optional, but if you opt in, you have to opt in fully. So you have to stop all your other classes. You can't take, you can't, you know, so if you're taking calculus, that ends. If you're taking a world language, that ends. If you're really waiting to take this, this super cool elective senior year, you're gonna have to choose, okay? But what that does, as you can see, is it opens up the day entirely, right? We don't have conflicts. We don't have um, uh, other scheduling issues. We have the students, they're, they're, they're captive in a sense, right? We've got them from, uh, from 8.30 to three, they're ours. And that enables us, again, think about that distinction between efficiency and effectiveness, right? As a classroom teacher, I'm trying to figure out how to sort of shoehorn as much learning as possible into a 45 minute block. Right? How can I sort of squeeze or just get a little bit more learning in? When it's their only academic commitment, if a discussion is going great at minute 45, it's no big deal. We just extend the discussion. It can go 60 minutes. It can go 90 minutes. We can plan for longer things. We've planned to get off campus. The pandemic has had other plans for us for the past two years. But next year, you know, we will regularly get off campus. Um, both to do community engagement work and to engage with, you know, Professor Chetty down at Harvard or other folks like that. So it's 10 weeks long, it's their spring trimester. And it's focused on a broad interdisciplinary theme, right? So the theme in uh, 2020 was community class and carbon. This year's theme was democracy and dissent. It's ungraded. This was important to us. Um, it's, I, I, we just finished not grading a bunch of seniors in the spring. So I have more, I have thoughts on this to fill like 10 webinars. I'll just note that it's ungraded for now. And I'm happy to talk more about that if there are any questions. Uh, and we use the mastery transcript. So this is a new way of thinking about um, not just a student transcript, which is just sort of a formal document, but student learning, which I'll say more about uh, later in this presentation. And importantly for us, right, it's, it's an experiment in terms of what school can be. And it's an effort, this language at the end to reimagine the grammar of schooling. You know, you can think about the grammar of schooling as really sort of the basic building blocks of schooling, time and space and classes and grades and assessment. Uh, so we wanted to say like, what would happen if we didn't try to just use the zero to six scale, 45 or 75 minutes at a time? Uh, but what if we reimagine things? This is a typical day for a PA student. I imagine this was pretty much what it looked like for all of you when you were students here. Some of the classes might be different. PHRE is our shorthand for philosophy and religious studies. What we're trying to do with the workshop is this. This is the one semi-cool visual, by the way. So please don't blink, you will miss the only like modestly like engage, visually engaging thing. Oh, oh, all right, it's back. Okay, I did it. There it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, but the idea is that instead of having a stack of classes that are going in six different directions with six different teachers, you have a central theme and then everything converges on that. Okay, so if you're doing math, for example, you're starting to think about gerrymandering and how that relates to democracy and dissent. If you're doing philosophy and religious studies, you're thinking about uh, human nature, for example, or political theory or things like that. If, you know, for science, what we actually did, we, we thought some about evolutionary biology, right? How do we think about uh, cooperation and, and uh, competition and things like that. You know, art, what does protest art look like? What does propaganda look like? Um, so the goal here is to design for unity and to design for collaboration and to have that be sort of a non-negotiable principle that we start with rather than having students just because of the way their classes are go in four or five or six different directions and hope that maybe they can make some connections between them on their own. 
just to say a little bit more about our approach. Um, we told the students that there were sort of three dispositions or three habits of mind that we wanted them to practice, we wanted them to cultivate. And I'll say more about those uh, in a bit. It's civic engagement, practice and craft and um, learning to learn. When we talk about democracy and dissent though, um, it was important for us, of course, to teach the students about this and to provide them meaningful learning experiences. So as I was saying before, right, we read Plato, we read Dostoevsky, we read some Rousseau, we watched documentary films. We had a number of great guest speakers come in. So documentary filmmakers like Mackie Alston from the class of 83, you know, Braxton Winston, who's a politician in North Carolina, Adisu Demissi, you know, who does voting rights and was management of Cory Booker's campaigns a number of years ago. We had, um, you know, Boston Mobilize come in, which just talked to the students about organizing, right? What does organizing look like? And how can we think of that as a kind of skill? You know, we had students lead presentations about Hong Kong and about Israel, Palestine. Um, they brought in their own, you know, they, they had sort of like a current events club basically and book clubs where they were doing these kinds of things. So it was, crucially important for us, of course, to give them language and ideas and experiences connected to democracy and dissent. But in the absence of grades, we wanted them to think about these three different areas and to cultivate certain habits. So one way of thinking about what we were doing is uh, democracy and dissent is still a priority, of course, but we're also putting forward a particular vision of what we want a student in the workshop to know and to do and to be like. So in terms of civic engagement, right, what does it mean to understand the communities that you're a part of, right? That could be the immediate workshop community of these 20 students. It could be the Phillips Academy community. It could be the greater town of Andover community, the national and the global communities. So what does, uh, engaged and, and reflective civic engagement look like. In terms of practice and craft, um, our thinking here was deeply informed by a wonderful book, which, which I would uh, warmly recommend to any of you. It's called An Ethic of Excellence. The author's name is Ron Berger. Uh, he's just this extraordinary teacher who's also a woodworker. Um, but his idea is that uh, what we want to do in education is to try to, he, he has this wonderful language, to instill in students a taste for excellence, okay? So in talking to students, when, when you ask them about their time here, they sometimes talk about a kind of academic triage, right? So I know I've got this chemistry test coming up on Friday, so I put off my, English reading and my history reading and I cram for the chemistry test. And then, you know, five minutes before English class, I scan it really quickly. And then I talk in the first few minutes of class. So the teacher's like, oh yeah, Andy definitely did the reading. And then, you know, I have the chemistry test that I perform on, but then by Monday or Tuesday, I've kind of forgotten the chemistry a little bit, you know, and then I have to catch up on English. So what we wanted to say to the students in a sense was, Let's do a little bit less potentially. And let's try to get in the habit of seeking out feedback, you know, both from peers and from teachers in the workshop, from reflecting on my own work and to uh, try to produce a smaller number of things this senior spring that I'm really proud of, right? Not to have a bunch of so-so work, like that's actually, not very interesting. All you're doing then is just sort of habituating yourself to mailing it in. That's, that, that, that's not a very good use of our and over education, but to say, no, like let's really work, right? To develop what Berger is saying, right? That taste for excellence. Um, so that's a, this second aspiration. And then the th third one, learning to learn that that's what we're, for us that refer, refers to sort of metacognitive dispositions. So the ability, um, for example, to recognize like when I'm stuck and to ask for help, you know, which, which might sound sort of easy or like a no brainer, but when you are 
17 or 18 and have Google, you know, you can just sort of sit with Google open and a blank Word document open and spend hours being lost there a little bit. Or another aspect of metacognitive reflection that's very important involves mental models, right? Being able to organize your knowledge and to, um, to not have your learning about a particular topic be a bunch of disconnected facts, right? But to instead be um, organized. So an example of that, in case I'm, I'm being a little unclear, uh, a teacher in the workshop, Chris Jones, he's, the, he's, he's a history teacher. I used to sit in on his US history classes. And I remember him saying once to his students that US history is, a, is the story of the efforts to expand uh, the meaning of all men are created equal, right? So to move that beyond sort of white Protestant landowners in the you know late uh, 18th century. So it's it's the story of efforts to expand the meaning of all men were created equal, and the simultaneous efforts to push back on that expansion. So that's not all of U.S. history, right? But if you have a mental model like that in your head, you can understand Obama, you can definitely understand Trump, you can understand the Civil War, you can understand Reconstruction. So all of a sudden, right, instead of history being just a bunch of disconnected facts, right, you've got this organizing thing. So we really spent some time working with students to help them create and refine and develop these mental models. Sorry, I love mental models, so I could go on and on about this just in terms of student work, like what did they actually do? So the first year, um, we had some wonderful presentations. This student on the left, Juna Jang, wrote um, about what it was like to, um, you know, it was this long, very meaningful narrative piece about her relationship with her, her mother, uh, who encouraged her to wear a mask very early on, well before anyone in the States was, this is 15 or 16 months ago now her unwillingness to do so, her eventual choice to do so, how that helped her make sense of what it meant to be Asian and to be a daughter. Um, this, this other piece on the right, what, what this student did, Claire, she was not here on campus. She was back in, in Portland, Maine last spring, spring of 2020, but she got very interested in the local food system. So she actually went around Maine and just mapped out the local sort of food supply chain. Where is seafood coming from? Where's the produce coming from? So she was calling people up, she was interviewing them. She ultimately made this extraordinary um, Google Earth presentation, which has all these pins and tabs and other things you can sort of click on. And it's like, you know, here's Tom's, you know, grocery store. Here are these guys who my family has shopped with for two generations. And you really begin to see this, this sort of network coming together. And in terms of the work of these two students, right? Wait, wait, Claire's in particular is this wonderful example of civic engagement, right? Here is someone who's very clearly uh, looking into her community, trying to make sense of it, reflecting on it um, in really positive and meaningful ways. And then some pieces this year, um, some of these screenshots aren't as good, but this on the left that I'm circling here, we had a student make a really compelling documentary film on adultism. This was not even a term I was particularly familiar with. Um, a little different than ageism, but it's, it's when you're sort of, uh, you know, looking uh, down on or not taking young, young people or, or, or students in particular seriously. So, uh, you know, this person interviewed some of his classmates. They, uh, we reflected on questions of activism you know, and ways in which people in power, both nationally and other ways are often multiple generations older than them. Um, and what it means to have viscerally, to feel like you have a very different uh, stake in the world, uh, you know, as someone who's 17 or 18 or 19 compared to someone who's in their 60s or 70s or 80s or things like that, right? This student in the center, um, this is just one of many extraordinary photographs she did really reflecting on her sense of identity, right? You can see sort of the passport things there and this merging of photographs and, you know, really uh, using, uh, you know, visual arts and this artistic medium to try and probe questions of identity. And then this final one on the right, we had a student looking at um, 
the Silicon Valley and trying to understand um, her community. She, she was a remote student and um, spent a lot of time in California sort of uh, working with her local library and then just trying to use the uh, Opportunity Atlas and some other things to try and understand how Silicon Valley had ended up the way that it did. Just a couple last thoughts. You know, this, this was particularly meaningful to hear halfway through we had students present on work that they'd done. Um, and what this student uh, said, you know, I've learned more about how I learn in these past five weeks than I learned in the previous four years. Now I'm not just learning for a grade. So that was good. I, some other students probably did need some grades. You know, I, 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 like I, I don't want to go off on this tangent, but you know, a few uh, sticks and or carrots might have been, you know, we, we're still refining that a bit. But what was important, right, is we want, Ted Sizer has this wonderful language that he used at, in other schools, but the first principle of these schools, the coalition of essential schools, they were called, he would say students should learn to use their minds well. And I think what we see here with this wonderful quotation from Angie is just that she's figuring out how to learn and she's figuring out how she learns. And if we look at the educational research, what makes people lifelong learners is actually that kind of self-understanding. It's that uh, they, they understand sort of how they learn, how they, um, how to organize knowledge, they begin to self-consciously uh, articulate and refine schema. You can see that's actually what she's done here in this slide. She's presenting a mind map that she made. And, and it's that kind of agency that is what really uh, gives students that wish to, to learn and keep learning. And then this was exciting too. Um, you know, we, I, I wrote a piece sort of detailing some of the interviews and things like that. And these are just some of these reflections. Nicole Furlong in the upper left is a professor at Teachers College at Columbia. Um, John Mehta actually wrote a book that was very influential for our work. Um, you know, so he was uh, happy to hear that. And then Jennifer Bryan is an educational consultant. So she's in sort of the nonprofit world, but this was, um, you know, this was heartening to see that uh, I, I think um, there was a, that there was deep interest in this. You know, I, I presented at a national education conference, and we had a hundred people show up, and you know, we we're having follow-up conversations with some schools. So uh, we don't have this totally right yet. We're very much still still working on it, but I think people have a sense that the way we're educating students is working for some, but not all. That there could be a different way forward, but there's not necessarily a clear sense of what that could be or how it could be. So for us to just sort of try this out, I think is um, something that, that is contributing to the uh, educational discourse and to the broader community and is something that we're really excited to, to keep pushing forward. Oh yeah, this is one last thing, which I think is, this is just sort of my thank you slide to folks who aren't necessarily in the room, but part of what made this so meaningful, you can see we collaborated with, you know, IDO a little bit with Klingenstein Center, that's at Teachers College, you know, some of these are schools, Casco Bay High School is an extraordinary school up in Portland, Maine, Tulsa term is in Tulsa, obviously an experiential school. So a big part of this work for us was also just doing research and visiting other um, high schools and connecting with nonprofits uh, so that their ideas and learning could inform what we're doing. And then of course, as you would imagine, right, we're also, we continue to be in touch with them and they're learning from our experiences. And so it, we're, we're, we're creating these uh, really vibrant communities in, in fun and meaningful ways. All of you are Andover students. I, I don't think it would be a return to your alma mater without a little bit of homework. Um, so if you are interested, you know, feel free to take a screenshot of this or something like that. Um, this, just to talk you through, this top one is some of the presentations that students from the class of 2020 did. They actually made their own website in, in, really, in a really wonderful way. We're still in the process of uploading the work from the class of 2021. We, you know, uh, 
graduation was on Sunday, so it will take us a bit to, to get that stuff up on the website. That next uh, URL links to that um, article I wrote where I outlined some of the uh, educational research I did with the students and some of our thinking behind it. That book I mentioned, uh, you know, John Meta, who is that professor, In Search of Deeper Learning, that's a long book, but if you Google Meta and find they have some shorter things, even in the New York Times, which deeply informed our thinking. The Ron Berger book, which I'll mention again and did not make it on this slide is uh, An Ethic of Excellence, which is truly just a wonderful read. And then this book by Grant, uh, this article by Grant Wiggins, which we loved, which, you know, the futility of trying to teach everything of importance. It, it, if I can ever learn to title my articles that well, I, you know, I will be a happy, uh, happy man. So yeah, that's, that's really it. If, if, if any of you are on, you know, Twitter or other things and want to follow us. Um, we're at the Tang, we're at Tang Institute. We'd be happy to do it. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, but yeah, I would welcome the chance to, you know, hear any thoughts or answer any uh, questions or anything like that, that, that might be on your mind. Thank you, Andy. We have two um, questions that have come through in the chat, which um, I'm happy to share. And then if anyone else wants to throw questions in the chat, you're also welcome to unmute yourself um, and ask live. So Sarah Sue Jones asked, has participation in the workshop spurred any students to decide to take a gap year before college or influenced their post PA plans? intended college majors in other ways? Great question, thank you so much. Yeah, we, we've actually, well, let me say this. I don't know, we do have a number of students from this year's workshop and last year's workshop who have taken or are taking gap years. This may be because the workshop sort of attracts those kinds of folks a little bit who are like, yeah, you know, um, but, what we have found is that um, giving students this opportunity to really dig in to the work, you know, and to work closely with the teacher and to do two, three, four, five drafts of something. Um, I think it, it, it gives them a little bit more they're a little bit more engaged during senior spring than they otherwise would be. And they have just a different sense of what the intellectual life can be like in college, whether they're choosing to major in one thing or another thing or something else. But we are, we're still in the process of sort of doing follow-up conversations with year one. And, um, you know, this year's students, of course, have only graduated, but that, that, that's a wonderful question to, be asked and it's something we can definitely, you know, those kinds of things we want to think about longer term as we try to make an argument for uh, this being a, a meaningful way to, uh, to learn. And then we have um, one from Allison Colbert and um, lovely, lovely acknowledgement at the beginning. I'm sure you're still recovering from this year, but have you picked your 2022 theme yet? Good question. We have not. I'm open to suggestions. I don't. I don't. If you, if you have one, or if anyone else does, I mean, we asked the students this question. A number of them said things around technology. Uh, so I, you know, you could imagine something around misinformation and disinformation, for example. Um, certainly, something just about the role that phones play in their lives. But also, you know, I think that questions of capitalism come up and you know, the power Mark Zuckerberg has compared to like, um, you know, the president or the former president or things like that. So there are a number of, um, there are a number of, uh, of possibilities, but yeah, I'm very serious actually. If you have thoughts, please, please feel free to send them my way. Can I add, just ask a question? Yes, please. Yes. Also, hi. Hi, it's very nice to see you, Margo. Yeah. Yes, hi. nice to see you again. Um, it, it sounds great. Uh, 
I work, I'm a high school teacher. I work, um, I'm a middle and high school teacher, actually. Uh, um, that's what I did with my PA education. Uh, and I, 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 you know, love the idea of something like this, but GE we would never allow that kind of thing. It does sound like a very easily pickable summer, like a, or a program that could be developed into a summer program or something that can, um, that can, that can reach students outside of the PA community and the relatively privileged community. Um, is there any plans down the line for engaging with, I'm taking that, is it taking that as a yes? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, I mean, that is our hope, absolutely. In, I mean, it's one of these things, the first year we did this, Margo, was totally remote, totally asynchronous. You know, we had envisioned this like on campus, immersive, we were gonna go to an organic farm once a week and like be in the dirt, you know? So, you know, we were on Zoom and Loom and Slack. This year, it was, it was actually hybrid. We had a couple students not on campus, a couple. So we feel like we've both done it twice and zero times. Um, but in terms of a model, right? I think like if we think about the workshop as a model or a, um, a way to connect students to their communities, to connect students to, the, to each other and to, um, think differently about what learning could be, right? Not just performance for grades, then yes, absolutely. And then once we feel like we're getting a little further along with this model, we would continue to collaborate with some of those people a few slides back, you know, that public school in Maine and uh, Tulsa term is Holland Hall, which is an Episcopal school in, in um, Oklahoma. And then sort of say, well, how can we connect other how can we connect this to other educators or other nonprofits or things like that? That kind of outreach is um, certainly something that, you know, Oscar Tang did and does care a lot about. And it's something that's a real priority for Renard Kington as well. So it's on our minds and, and truly like if you have thoughts or I, I think you actually emailed us like a year or two ago about this. Yeah. Yeah. And we might've traded a message or two. Um, let's, I, 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 I like, you know, let's keep talking or let's, you know, like, let's, like, let's figure out how to do it for sure. May I ask a question? Please. Uh, so I'm a Dean of Faculty and Academics. And one of the questions that I have is focused on educator buy-in because the students are enthusiastic. They feel it in their bones when this kind of learning is happening but often it's the educators that we struggle with onboarding to this way of thinking, primarily because of the efficiency efficacy conundrum. So I'm curious, what sorts of scaffolds have you put in place for the educators in order to promote more educator buy-in and in order to promote the type of professional development they may need to transition from their previous practices? I mean, these are the questions. This is great. We got to bring you in. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So we, we have worked, we spent, we spend a good amount of time together each summer working on this. We meet weekly to um, sort of plan the program. I mean, part of what I did was just sort of tap people on the shoulder so it was like, who are the five or six teachers in different departments who are already in some ways doing things like this? So I'm kind of making an end run around your question, Melanie. You know, it's like, who is already sort of trying to think differently about assessment? Who's already maybe doing some standards-based stuff or some mastery-based stuff? Who has partnered with other teachers to do interdisciplinary work? But in terms of scaffolds, what we've really had to do and maybe I can say a little bit more about grading now, because it's just like, if kids aren't complying, at the end of the day, you still kind of have grades, right? And students want to go to college. And even if it's senior spring, they don't want to totally muck things up. So if you don't have that, and, and we chose not to have that, it really becomes like a pedagogical design issue, right? How do we set up, how do we incur, how do we nudge students towards assessments that are, um, engaging and meaningful, but how do we also design opportunities for them to share their learning, which are authentic and have some stakes to them. So often for us, that meant presentations to their peers, 
you know, really just having to uh, get up in a, to their classmates and say, you know, here's good work that I'm doing, or here's something in progress that I'd like your feedback on. So trying to figure out structures like that for students um, was one way of supporting their learning. And then in terms of the faculty, it's, I mean, it's still ongoing for us. We are trying to balance our aspirations with the reality of not just teaching spring term seniors, but teaching spring term seniors who've been socialized a particular way, certainly for their time at Andover and more often than not for 11 plus years before that. So we can't just say no grades, no classes, no structure, go do it. Like they'll just hang out with their friends. And I would too, you know, so um, we are trying to figure out like, how to respect their autonomy and how to be directive and sort of live somewhere in the middle between replicating school, you know, and redoing the grammar of schooling and removing so many constraints that um, it's actually an unsupportive learning environment. Thank you, Andy. Um, I just, um, I'm looking at the time. I know we were slated to wrap um, around 4.45 Eastern. I just wanna make a last ask if there's any questions that people would like, um, but otherwise we will thank you all for attending and thank you, Andy Huzio, for that awesome presentation. And I hope we'll see some of your faces at some other virtual events this weekend. Yeah, happy reunion, everyone. I'm happy to see all of you, to re-see several of you, uh, to meet those of you I haven't met. I hope to see all of you back on campus soon. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful reunion weekend. Thanks. Thanks so awesome. much for, for showing up. Thank you, everybody. Great to see you all.